So uh, I've been a lot of places in the last three weeks. Um, I've gotten to know what it is to put my tray table up and my seat in the upright position. Um, and uh, so I'm excited to be back. I slept in my own bed last night. First good night of sleep I've had in a long time. I'm, uh, I'm recharging. So, but it was a great time. It was unbelievable. Just uh, people from all different denominations, both Canadian and American in New York. Uh, and Dallas, uh, and um, so I, I just appreciate your encouragement this summer and your support as I uh, went on some travel and, uh, you know, answered some invitations and spent some time with uh, basically a lot of people who've um, been Christians, but they've never really sunk their teeth into God's grace um, in a deep way, and so the response was wonderful, and, um, you know, everything I I did there is a ministry of this church, an extension of, of who we are as a body here in West Texas. So I come home, though, with a, a, some questions that people submitted, and um, these questions are ones that uh, I tried to pick some uncommon ones as well as some, some common ones. There's a good mix here this morning. And um, I want to just take an opportunity to address some of these, not only because those people will connect with us and hear our podcast and that sort of thing, but also because these are questions that would definitely come up among humans, and that's us. We're humans. So uh, without any delay, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Um, could you speak to the idea of an impending judgment of God on our nation because of our sins as a nation? Um, you know, what I would say to that is that it's high time that uh, Christians in general uh, stop looking at, at spirituality in terms of uh, physical boundaries and physical borders. That um, the promise of the new covenant was given to Abraham, and this Abraham promise was basically that he would be the father of many nations uh, by faith, not just Israel. And not just the United States, but that all nations, from those nations, there would be people who would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And so this idea that God is just sort of looming over top of the United States and when, you know, this leader does this and when this leader does this, then God gets angry and then he curses America or refuses to bless America. What we basically got there, in addition to an, a, a conditional love of God that we're teaching, uh, we're also then proclaiming that uh, God is a respecter of our national boundaries when really God's will is that none perish but all believe. And so, you know, um, what I would say there is that, you know, we are blessed to be in the United States. We are blessed to be able to have a vote and a voice and you know, we do, if you were looking at it in terms of national boundaries, I mean, wow, the United States has more worldwide missions than any other country in the world. Our country happens to be loaded with lots of sincere Christians who care about other people. And that's awesome. But remember, these missions that we're doing, who are these missions to and who are they for? Well, they're so that any nation and any person on the planet can call upon his name and receive him. And so what we're saying is that the floodgates have been opened. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself, not just Jews, not just Americans. Uh, and so this idea that America is the new Israel, that's sort of the, the, the idea floating around out there among Christians, that America is the new Israel. And what we need to see is that God is thinking bigger than that. As awesome as our nation is, as amazing as it is to live in the United States, God is thinking bigger than our national boundaries. He's thinking about humans. For God so loved the world, the world, the world. And so, uh, you know, when we, when we look at this impending judgment of God, we need to remember that before the United States ever existed, before there was ever the Republican Party, before there was ever the Democratic Party, before there were ever any political parties, there was this gospel that is now thousands of years old. And it's all about Jesus Christ. The answer is not Washington, D.C. The answer is Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Okay, so uh, in light of your teachings on God's grace, what are your views on the legalization of same-sex marriage? This is a, a very current event, isn't it? It's just happened. And, you know, what I would say there is, um, why, why are we shocked that this has happened? Let's, let's take a group of people who, in general, do not hold a worldview they do not hold a worldview that there has been a, the fall of mankind. They do not believe in the Genesis fall. They do not believe that sin entered into the world at a certain point and ruined everything. And so without the fall of humanity in the equation, then ultimately that leaves humans to look at this phenomenon over here, which thousands of people are engaged in, and then look at this phenomenon over here, which millions of people are engaged in, and say, well, these are just normal um, human behaviors occurring all over the planet. Why would they say such a thing? Because there's no room for the fall of humanity in their thinking. And so if masses of people are doing something, well, then we'll just justify it because masses of people are doing it. And so it's a normal human behavior. Uh, and so what we need to see in this equation, really what's missing is the role of the fall. God tells us that something happened, that sin entered into the world, and not all human behavior is okay. Not all human behavior should be justified. But let's not sit here and pretend again let's not sit here and pretend that the answer is Washington that the answer is going to be policies of our government we are going to get disappointed over and over and over look at the trend where we're headed you know look at 50 years ago 40 years ago 30 are we getting more conservative are we getting more conservative or more uh, liberal in our thinking so don't be surprised when our nation goes this way. Now, do not hear me saying we just give up. What we do is we resist and we vote our conscience and we vote our hearts and we participate as citizens in the United States. But again, the, the real issue as believers, this is what we need to see, that whether something is legal or illegal, whether 10,000 people are doing something or 10 million people are doing something, the real issue is do they have Jesus Christ? Do they know Jesus Christ? And what are we really going to be about in this? If we could get everything that we don't like to be illegal, what have we accomplished? If we could get everything that we don't like to be legislated against and we could get all the politicians to agree with our personal opinions, then what? We'd have a really nice conservative group of spiritually dead people. So the answer is not conservatism. The answer is Jesus Christ. Now, I agree with a whole lot of conservative viewpoints, but I still have to recognize that the answer is not 200 years old. The answer is thousands of years old. The answer is eternal, <laughs> and his name is Jesus. So while we vote and we do what we can and we fight and we speak up and we have a voice and we're privileged to do so, uh, let's not be shocked that when we delete the fall of humanity, that then society begins to justify all kinds of things. Um, why does God bless and give to those who do not practice or follow the Bible? And then why does it always seem like God gives me the leftovers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, what I think we've got going on here is, um, you know, it's, it's ironic because in this view, we don't have a role for the fall again. See, because of the fall, then there's fallen DNA, there's disease, there's sin, there's anger, there's, um, in, you know, partial treatment of other people. There's, um, you know, a, a lot of things that aren't fair in this world because of the fall of humanity. So then we go and we put a God stamp. See, that's what this person is doing. They're putting a God stamp on everything that has happened to them. They're playing Connect Four. You know what Connect Four is, right? Come on, it's a Milton Bradley game. You should play it. <laughs> 
but Connect Four is, you know, this these chips, they're they're red and, and they're black, and you're connecting them in a line, and once you get four lined up, you win. Well, basically what we're doing here in this scenario is we're taking the circumstances of our life and we're trying to find a pattern, we're trying to connect things and see, and I, now I'm gonna see what God feels about me. Because look at this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, uh, that all lines up. You know, God must be really ticked at me. God must be really disappointed in me. God must think um, that because I did this thing in 1984, now he's getting me for that finally. So we start playing what I've often called Christian karma. It's Christian karma is what it is. And so why does God bless and give to those who do not practice or follow the Bible? Well, it's not about God. It's about the simple fact that we live on planet Earth and that anybody, believer or unbeliever, can work hard, do well, get money, earn a great living, be successful. I mean, don't we know thousands, millions of successful unbelievers? Obviously, Christianity is not about being successful or unsuccessful. It's about someone entirely different. Otherwise, we would have a lineup on, in this parking lot. It would go out onto the lawn, onto 66th Street, all the way out to Frankfurt. People would be lining up to come in here and be successful in terms of the world. So when you sign up for the idea of Jesus Christ, what you're saying is, I believe that he's the son of God. I believe that he died because I needed him to die. And I believe that he rose again to give me new life because I desperately needed new life. But never, never in the deal, never in the contract is, is, is it that you will have some great circumstances all the time and easy living and lots of money and huge success. I mean, look at the early church. The early church is a perfect example. One guy's rumored to be crucified upside down. Some of them are stoned. One guy gets up and walks away after being stoned, but it still hurt. <laughs> I mean, you know, and then the Son of God himself didn't exactly have smooth circumstances and easy living. And so then it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to talk about what he endured. Um, and then, you know, the scripture tells us if anybody thinks that, that godliness is a means to financial gain, they are of depraved mind. <laughs> They're local, right? <laughs> Crazy. Whoever, whoever said such a thing and who should be proclaiming such a thing? Nobody. And the only reason that people who proclaim such things are, are sometimes wealthy is because they're getting paid to say those things. And they're asking you to give them money so that God will give you back threefold. And they end up really making a killing off of it. So, uh, you know, what's really important to see is that, you know, I've said it before, but it deserves repetition here that planet Earth is fallen. Planet Earth is coming at you but Christ is working in you. Don't play connect four with planet earth to try to figure out if God loves you. If you wanna connect four, how about this? You're totally forgiven, that's one. You're totally freed from the law with total acceptance, that's two. You've got Christ living in you and you've been placed into Christ forever and he'll never leave you. How about connecting those four? Yeah. Um, he, he did a good job on that one, I'd say. Uh, what happens if a person accepts Christ as Savior, but after that lives all of his life sinning? Sound familiar? <laughs> uh, if for the rest of his life he doesn't think in Christ, but just lives his life practicing sin, will he lose his salvation? Well, the short answer is no if you're saying, will he lose it? Because you're, you're implying that he had it, okay? So if you have it, you can't lose it. Uh, if you are born again, you can't be unborn. God gave us this picture because it's real, but he also gave us this picture because imagine trying to get a child to be unborn after they're born. It just can't happen. It's not going to happen. And so uh, there's a passage in Hebrews that says, he is able to save us completely, because he always lives, because he always lives to intercede for us. 
So I've often said that the, the length of your salvation is tied up in the length of Jesus' life. You will be saved as long as Jesus lives because he's able to save you completely because he always lives to intercede for you. The definition of eternal life is not this. This is everlasting life. Everlasting life is life with no end. Eternal life is life with no beginning and no end. Whose life had no beginning? Jesus' life. If you have eternal life, whose life do you have? Jesus' life. And so it's not your life made longer. It's not your life made better. It's Jesus' life. You will be saved as long as Jesus lives. So eternal life is not temporary life. Eternal life is not life until you blow it. <laughs> eternal life is eternal life, and it's Christ's life. So let me get to the heart of this. Um, we don't know who's saved and who's not. Uh, there are people who play church, play religion, clean up their life a little, try to stop smoking and stop drinking, and then they think they're you know, good or whatever. They've made it about behavior. They've made it about an improvement program instead of about what Jesus Christ did. They're looking at what they're doing instead of what Jesus did. So, you know, there are people, even preachers, who Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Why would he say, I never knew you? Because they were never saved. What, what are they bragging about? They're saying, look what we did in your name. Look at what their focus is. God, look what I did for you. Aren't I just great? And I did it in your name, God. And he's like, are you seriously telling me what you did for me? Do you not see what I did for you in the cross and the resurrection? Your focus is totally backwards. So there are people who have the wrong focus. They put the focus on themselves and what they're doing, cleaning up lifestyle, instead of putting their focus on Jesus Christ and what he's done. So we don't know, you know, Paul says it this way, do not say who will descend into the lower parts of the earth. That's to bring Christ up from the dead. Do not say who will ascend into heaven, basically, because that's to bring Christ down off the cross. Instead, uh, what do we say? The word is near you. Who, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, anybody, even the thief on the cross, with no performance at all, anybody can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. So let's not play the game of he's saved, she's not, she is, he's not. Let's not play the game of predicting. Um, instead, we just need to, you know, the, the Bible says we pass one test. It says this is the test. Does Christ live in you? Have you received Christ? Worry about you, not somebody else. Does Christ live in you? If so, then you pass the test because you've got his life forever. Do we have to be baptized to be saved? No. <laughs> okay. Why, why would I say that? Well, again, let's visit our friend, the thief on the cross. He didn't have time to visit the local swimming hole. Uh, he had about 12 minutes before fade to black. <laughs> and uh, so he expressed his... Uh, faith in Jesus Christ in his identity. I believe this guy is who he says he is. Will you take me to paradise because I believe you are Lord and Savior and you have the ability to do this. And so he put his faith in Christ and he was saved and Jesus confirmed that. Jesus said, today you will be with me. Now, there was no H2O involved in that. There was vinegar nearby, but no H2O. <laughs> and so this is precisely why the Apostle Paul said, God did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. They were bickering in Corinth. Can you imagine it? A bunch of Greek people arguing and bickering. All right, not like us Americans, right? <laughs> but they were arguing and bickering over who baptized who and who has the better status. Oh, you got baptized by Peter? Well, I got baptized by Paul. And they're arguing over who's the greatest apostle and who had the best baptism and all that. And Paul is just frustrated with the whole thing. And he writes them and he says, I thank God that I did not baptize many of you. Otherwise, this thing would be a bigger mess than it is. And he says, God didn't send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. Now, if baptism saved people, then Paul would have been sent to baptize. But what saves people? 
the preaching and the hearing of the gospel. So God sent Paul to preach the gospel, not to baptize people. Peter writes in his epistle, he says, baptism saves you. But then he's very clear because he thinks they're going to misunderstand. He says, uh, not, not the washing of your body with water, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. So it's, bapti- it's being immersed in, baptized in, being placed into the resurrection life of Christ. That's what saves you. So that's why Peter goes to great lengths to clarify that. He doesn't want anybody to think that baptism saves you. Not the washing of your body with water, but being put into, put into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is the central message of the Sermon on the Mount? You can't do it. That's the bottom line. Really, I mean, let's, let's, let's think about it now. Cut off your hand. Raise your hand if you've got your hand. Okay, so you're disobeying the words of Jesus. <laughs> Afterwards, we're going to have an amputation ceremony. <laughs> Cut off your hand if it's caused you to sin. Pluck out your eyes if it's caused you to sin. Um, then, uh, you know, be perfect. Now, if you don't understand perfect, allow him to explain. Be perfect just like God is perfect, (laughs) okay? Good luck with that one. That one's going to leave a mark. (laughs) Now, uh, then, um, as you journey through the rest of this passage, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, I mean, what you see is that these are nails in the spiritual coffin for anybody that thinks they're doing a okay. Um, He tells, similarly, he tells the rich man, go sell everything. The rich man goes away sad about that. Jesus picked the one thing he couldn't do. Um, The other thing that's important to realize, you know, we got people teaching the Sermon on the Mount. There's whole books on how the Sermon on the Mount is the standard we should aspire to. Well, remember that hell is threatened three times in the Sermon on the Mount. This is not... It's not a nice little cute passage for Christian growth. It is three times it says you'll be thrown into hell. You're in danger of the fires of hell. You're in danger of judgment. You're in danger of hell. And the point there is that before the cross, did you hear that? Before the cross, Jesus is sitting on a rock somewhere surrounded by Jewish people. And he's giving them the true spirit of the law. He is showing them, he says several times, you have heard it said, but I tell you this. You have heard the standard is here, but I show you that the standard is really here. You thought that not murdering and not committing adultery was the standard, but I'm telling you that just looking or even getting angry, that's the real standard. And then everybody walks away from that, not with a nice warm feeling inside. They walk away from that totally desperate and in need of grace. And through the death and resurrection of Christ, that is how we get the grace. So this is why, you know, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, it says, if you forgive, God will forgive you. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. Now, that's not the New Testament message. The New Testament message is not that we earn forgiveness. We don't earn forgiveness by saying, God, God, look at how I've been so forgiving to friends and family. God, look at me, but don't look at the holidays, but look at me. (laughs) Look at me in general. Most of the year, I've been a pretty good forgiver. Now, forgive me in the same way that I forgive others. And if I don't forgive others, then don't forgive me. Yeah, you're free to just hold it back if I've held it back. Man, that 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 is a dangerous prayer to pray. If that's what you want from God, then you are denying the total forgiveness that we now have in Christ. The total forgiveness that we have in Christ is a no-strings-attached forgiveness. Colossians 3.13, forgive others because God already forgave you. Ephesians 4.32, forgive others because God already forgave you. Which came first? God's forgiveness of you came first. So pass it on to other people, not as some condition, but because it's so 
awesome that we get to celebrate this forgiveness from God. And he's designed us to soak that in, absorb it, celebrate it, and then pass that attitude on to others as we forgive them. So that's the central message of the Sermon on the Mount. I can't, only you can, and I'm going to let you save me. So they needed to be desperate. They needed their pride to be stripped down. They needed to see the true spirit of the law. All right. Um, how is the best way to teach, what is the best way to teach a grace message to your teen while at the same time they need law or guidelines? And then it says in big capital letters, help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, you know, this deserves a lot of attention. We don't have that much time, but let me just say this. Um, your teens don't need the law. Okay, let's, let's be clear on that. Teens don't need the law, meaning the Old Testament law. Uh, teens are in a place where they need to know the gospel, okay? So the law, meaning the Old Testament law, was never even given to the Gentiles. I assume you're talking about a Gentile teen. <laughs> so what we all need, teens or adults, we all need the message of the gospel. At the same time now, you know, you're likely talking about rules at school, rules uh, in the workplace, rules at home. Um, you know, Paul talks about this in Romans. He says, hey, Romans, pay your taxes, would you? I mean, because the law requires that you pay your taxes. Hey, be at peace with all men. Hey, respect your authorities. So what we need to see is like there's not a clash or a contrast between grace and functioning in society. I mean, the heart of Jesus Christ is that we obey those in authority. The heart of Jesus Christ is that we obey uh, the rules that have been put in place for our protection. It doesn't mean that we've become a legalist because we're doing what to keeps us from punishment in, from the world's vantage point. There are earthly circumstances, earthly consequences to our actions. And many times, you know, it says if you're suffering for being a Christian, great. But if you're suffering because you've done some stuff that's bad, <laughs> you're kind of on your own there. I mean, God's not going to send in a check and bail you out. Uh, dad or mom might, but God's not in the business of swooping down and rescuing all believers from earthly circumstances. He says in there that those things happen without partiality. So planet Earth functions in a certain way. And... Um, you know, listening to mom and dad is not legalism. Listening to the laws of the land is not legalism. Sometimes we got to just say it's common sense. And so that's what Christ is up to in us. So don't be afraid to uh, have some uh, boundaries. The teens are going to hate me for this, right? But don't be afraid to have boundaries, to have laws of the land, to have rules in place, curfews, that sort of thing. I mean, we don't want to be unwise in the raising of our children. We want them to have a period of time where they're getting acquainted with the gospel, beginning to trust Jesus Christ, but we're looking out for them because they're still developing people. In fact, we all are, and that's why we do have governments with laws, because there would be chaos without it. So I hope that helps uh, a little bit, but uh, don't, be, don't be focused on o Old Testament law. We, we do want to be proclaiming the excellencies of God's grace to our teens right from the get-go and showing them this dependent life on Christ. Um, all right, let's see. We're running out of time here. How about, um, is your teaching basically boiling down to let go, let God? Okay, that's a good question. I'd say yes and no. Um, for some people, when they think let go, let God, they're thinking good stuff. They're thinking, you know what? I can't control this. I can't achieve this. I'm going to do what I did. I'm going to do what I did when I got saved. When I got saved, I said, Lord Jesus Christ, I can't. You can, and I'm going to let you. Now, then I wake up and I live the Christian life, and I say, Lord Jesus Christ, I can't. You can, and I'm going to let you. That's the attitude. Just as you received him, so walk in him. There's no plan B. <laughs> it's the same thing, the same plan. I can't, you can, I'm going to let you. That's an eternal plan. 
So um, now at the same time, though, what I worry about is that let go, let God quickly becomes all of him and none of me. Now, I've, I've spoken against this in the past because there are victorious Christian life teachings out there that basically make you into a fire hose. And you've got no personality, no personhood. It's all Christ and none of you. And some people even go as far as you're becoming Jesus, a little Jesus and all that business. So uh, we want to be really, really careful. Uh, who is it that became the righteousness of God? You did. God, Jesus didn't have to become the righteousness of God. You did. Why? So you'd be compatible. Who is it that became the holy, righteous saint, the child of God? You did. Jesus was already holy and righteous. But the gospel made you holy and righteous and blameless so that you could be involved, so that you could participate, so that you could be united with Christ. Get this now, so that you could be yourself. A lot of Christians might understand the Christ in me message, but have you seen that you can be yourself? Have you seen that God is crazy in love with you, that he really even actually likes you, and that he's not trying to change your personality, he's not trying to change your sense of humor, he's not trying to change who you are. He wants to communicate, look, I did all of this because I, I love you and I like you and I accept you. A lot of people were acquainted with the generic love of God, but as far as acceptance, we're not there yet. Do you believe that you are an obstacle to God? Are you an obstacle or an instrument? I preached on that once. If that resonates with you, find that message. Are you an obstacle or an instrument? Because an obstacle means you're dirty and ugly and you got to get out of the way. An instrument means you're compatible with him. He likes you. He loves you. He accepts you. So is it let go, let God? Yes and no. He is the power. He is the source. He is God, and we are not. But we are his children, holy and dearly loved. And he wants us involved. He could have done everything without us. But he chose to create us. Then he chose to rescue us. Now he's choosing to include us. You really can use the, the two-step program. Learn who you are in Christ, and then wake up and be yourself. And then repeat. <laughs> Three steps. All right, we'll finish with this one. It's time to go soon. Last one of the day. What does the Sabbath really mean for New Testament Christians? This is great because there is a Sabbath for New Testament Christians, but it's just not what many people think. I mean, Hebrews 4 says, There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. We are people of God. There is a Sabbath rest for us, but it's not a day of the week. Now, notice what is so cool about this is that there is a picture, a symbol, a shadow in the Old Testament Sabbath. There is a meaning to it. Watch this. God created the world. How long did it take him? Six days, not seven. Nothing happened on the seventh day. He just chilled, okay? Now, six days. Now, where did we show up? We showed up on day six, right? You notice that? Everything was done. Then we show up. He says, name some animals or something and enjoy it. There was nothing for us to do there. We didn't add to the work. We didn't achieve the work. We didn't contribute. It wasn't God plus me, his help and my help put together. God did it. It was a finished work. He said, wake up and enjoy it. And then he rested, right? And then he gave to the Jewish people this seventh day, this rest. And it was a picture, a shadow of God doing everything. And then we get to celebrate and just say, whoa, Wow, cool, thank you, awesome. I get to enjoy because of what he did. Now, that's a picture of the gospel. Why is it a picture of the gospel? Because on day one, Jesus Christ was crucified. On day two, the day of confusion, the disciples are going, huh, what's going on? What? We've lost our Lord. <laughs> day three, resurrection, okay? And then now... Day four, we're living in it. It's a finished work. So day four and every day 
is a day of resting in what God has already done. You don't add to the finished work of Christ. You don't contribute to it. You don't maintain it. You don't sustain it. So all of that physical resting was a picture of our need today to wake up all the time and just go, whew, wow, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. See, even she's celebrating this. It's beautiful. And just proclaim, just proclaim the, the big wow and the big thank you about what Jesus has done. So very few Christians, gosh, I see a lot of them from different denominations. They're sitting in different church buildings. They're in different parts of the world. So very few Christians know what it means to enter God's rest and relax with God. I mean, it doesn't mean we do nothing and sit on our hands. I'm talking about just that the anxiety that the enemy creates, that the enemy stirs up anxiety within Christians. They're worried about losing something. They're worried about God's attitude toward them. They're worried about whether they're forgiven. They're worried about whether they're still saved. They're worried about the law. They're worried about being judged later. You name it. I mean, I could sit here and list 20 anxieties that Christians have. In many ways, if we don't watch it, we're more anxious than anybody else on the planet about all this stuff. Because think about it. Without grace, the God of the universe is looming over you, looking at your every deed, looking at your every work, and judging every single one of them. And the truth is, they're forgiven. <laughs> they're forgotten. You're freed from the law. You're totally under grace. And he's totally in love with you. So the truth is the polar opposite of the anxiety. And we spend our lives transitioning out of the anxiety into the truth. That's why John writes, I'm so thankful, I'm so grateful that I found you guys walking in truth. Truth is really important. The truth sets you free. Everything else makes you anxious. So the Sabbath rest is a constant invitation to go back and remember what Jesus did. Not what you're doing, but remember what Jesus did. And relax in it and thank God for it. Because that's all we can do. And any fruit, any works from that, it comes from a place of rest. That's the paradox. Grace results in works. Because grace works. Let's pray together. Father, we, uh, we want to rest. And... Um, we know that you've given us this spiritual rest. You've given it to us. You've given it to us eternally. Uh, we know that we're going to a new destination. We know that we have a salvation that is safe and secure. We, we know that. But uh, right now, right here, uh, we find ourselves in places of anxiety, and not just about forgiveness and your acceptance and and your spirit within us, but we start looking at circumstances, we start playing Connect Four, we start playing Christian Karma, and we are trying to read the tea leaves. Father, I just pray that we would read the pages of your love letter to us instead of trying to read the tea leaves. I just pray that you would remind us to connect those four, the forgiveness, the freedom, the identity, and the new life that you've given us, to connect those four in order to spell out your love. Father, we thank you for this love. We thank you for this acceptance. And we thank you that the truth will always, always set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys stand with us. Turned 